Welcome to Pete's Property Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Buyers and hosted by Pete Wargent, buyers agent, finance and real estate expert, and all-round property guru, plus published author. Join Pete for 30 minutes as he chats all things property with a new guest each week. Learn practical tips from the movers and shakers in the property industry and well-known personalities sharing their property journeys. G'day, welcome to this week's episode of the Pete Wargent Property Pod. I'm really excited to have a familiar face back on the podcast. Um, we spoke just a few months ago, Stephen Kukulis, aka The Kook. Steve, welcome. It's great to have you back on. G'day, Pete. Great to be here. And gosh, what has happened in the last few months? A lot. You're a hard man to track down. I think I might be right in saying you're one of the many Aussies who spent some time over in Europe recently. I think there's been a lot of people escaping after a couple of years being un- unable to get through the international border. Yeah, we had a, a, almost a month in Greece and it was just fabulous. I sort of lost the town. I actually grew a beard for that time, um, but common sense dictated that I remove it. So, uh, But boy, it was interesting, gorgeous place for a holiday. The villages around the islands are just stunning, but clearly there's an economic legacy from the uh, from the global crisis uh, a decade or more ago, that it's still a very troubled economy, if you like. But gee, food is good, can't you tell? <laughs> and just a beautiful place to go. Tourism regions like Crete, I was there last year, absolutely uh, firing back to life, which is great to see. But uh, okay, I guess one of the things that we can be thankful for in Australia is that we haven't had those sky high levels of youth unemployment that impacted countries like Italy and Greece and Portugal and Spain and a lot of those um, European areas. So um, I guess with that lead in, so the big news this week, Reserve Bank meeting always gets a lot of headlines and a lot of talking heads excited. So uh, 25 basis points, that, that was in line with what you were expecting, I think. Pretty much so. And I think from the RBA came prior to the October meeting, they are putting a lot of weight, and this sort of was reinforced in what the statement accompanying the rate hike was, and, and of course, Dr Lowe, the RBA governor, gave a speech in Hobart last night. Uh, They're putting a lot of weight on the global economy, the risk of a hard landing or recession, however you want to describe the risk of the US uh, weakening markedly, the Eurozone weakening, and China still coming to terms with how its economy is going to be performing when it presumably ends its lockdown soon. And they're saying that, well, maybe we don't have to hike as much. And in a strange way, they can ride on the coattails of this stalling in global demand in 2023, which will be one really important factor that then brings inflation back under control. So the rate hiking cycle's you know, clearly uh, been happening and there's a lag effect uh, between its implementation and, and cash flows for the average householder and the business sector as well. But the RBA, yeah, I think they're just being a little bit more cautious than, say, our friends at the Fed uh, or even the ECB for that matter, let alone the Bank of Canada and uh, RBNZ, who are still hiking like crazy. So a lot of people say to me, Steve, well, look, if the Federal Reserve takes its funds rate up to, say, 5%, well, we can't only take the cash rate to 3% because the difference is too big and we'll import some inflation. Now, the Reserve Bank has sort of countered that and said, well, you've got to look at all the currencies on a trade-weighted basis, not just the US dollar. But let's um, just talk some scenarios. If the Reserve Bank just does one more rate hike, for example, which I guess is what you've been talking about, uh, will inflation come down or is there a risk that it just uh, persists for longer if they don't tackle it more uh, forcefully? Yeah, a lot of issues there. I'm not a super-duper fan of interest rate differentials driving currencies. They are clearly important in the short term, but I recall several instances in the past where countries that didn't overhike got rewarded for a pro-growth strategy, uh, that they're the strong economy, let's park our money, so rather than fixed income into equities and other sort of asset classes within an economy that's growing strongly as opposed to putting our money that might have high interest rates with uh, with a recession. So you, it, 
I, I know it's always cheap to sort of say, look at some of the emerging market economies. Look at Turkey, for example. I think their interest rates are around 80%, if I'm not mistaken, and the Turkish lira has been an absolute dog of a dog. So, therefore, that's one little illustration of how interest rates don't necessarily protect the currency. So, that, that aside, um, yeah, we, we so we can have an interest rate gap between us and the US, for example, and even other economies in the world as well. And if they do over-tighten in those other economies, then yeah, we will benefit from that weakness in inflation that that would instill because I'm still a believer while, you know, stagflation is still being chatted about, you know, we get uh, a, a recession but with inflation being persistently high, that's some risk, of course, but that's more unusual than uh, usual. So if we were to have a hard landing overseas, then, you know, global inflation would would fall and you just have to look at things like supply chain issues, commodity prices, other indicators which were the catalyst for inflation going up, they're now turning down and we might, might just have to wait for the lags to work through the CPI data. Yes, yeah, so and you actually mentioned, uh, so we've had some figures out today, new uh, lending for housing down very sharply, biggest drop on record, building approvals generally softening quite a bit. So th- there's obviously a lag and it takes time to work through. I guess um, just looking at what financial markets are pricing for, Certainly, they've calmed down a little bit. They were very hawkish indeed uh, back in September, and it looks like a couple of rate hikes might have been clipped off the expectations. But is, is there an argument to say that potentially interest rates could be higher for longer if, if the Reserve Bank doesn't go as hard? Yes, I, I think that would be the conclusion because, of course, if they hiked aggressively, let's just say they tracked what the market was pricing in a month or so ago. And I, if I recall correctly, it was something above four and a quarter. It might have been, you know, four point four percent or something like that was at the most hawkish market pricing for RBA rates. If they did something like that, then yes, they would achieve their inflation target. And to be silly for just a moment, if they hiked to ten percent, you know, let's just be crazy for a moment, they would cause inflation to fall, there's no question. But it's a really important but. The RBA, and they've made this explicit, has an eye on growth and the labour market and unemployment. Dr Lowe hasn't quite said it explicitly like this, but I think he'd be happy to tolerate inflation being a little elevated if that meant that unemployment would be a little lower. Um, so that good old Phillips curve trade-off is something that is sort of the front of the mind of the RBA governor. But, if, of course, if they just go steadily baby steps and you know, maybe they pause very soon, you know, maybe in the first quarter of next year they do pause, then you know, they're not going to get that you know, sharp free-fall in inflation that perhaps will happen in the Fed if they go all the way through and hike to 5%. It's an interesting conundrum. There's a lot of uh, viewpoints online about that. It's good. It was good to see, actually, in the um, housing lending figures that uh, lending for new housing construction, it was at least good from an inflation standpoint anyway. It's, it's dropped yeah. all the way back to where it was in mid-2020. and That will take some of the heat off uh, materials prices and but trade. monetary policy works, Pete. You know, interest rate hikes do slow an economy, and you're seeing that in the those lending data that you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so, and uh, notably for new home sales, uh, housing construction, it's all. Uh, and I suppose it's worth noting that the Reserve Bank only really got going with mortgage um, with uh, cash rate increases back in around May. So yeah. it takes it's going to take time for three percentage points of increases to actually flow through, and you know, arguably it could take eighteen months. Um, the housing market. Now, I've seen a lot of uh, back and forth on social media debating with various uh, people. What do you think this trajectory, interest rates that we're talking about, what do you think the impact is going to be on the housing market? We've already seen some drops and in some cases, um, some sharp drops in housing prices. Uh, They've cooled a bit recently or the the declines have eased a little bit. What do you think the overall impact might be at a macro level? Interest rate hikes do dampen demand for housing. They do uh, dampen borrowing capacity. They lower the amount of money that people are allowed to borrow, I suppose. Uh, so that's clearly one factor that's been dampening, one factor that's been, you know, the driver of this uh, weakness in house prices. So depending which data you use, and I, I must confess, I don't know the difference strictly between core logic, which has a much higher profile, it must be acknowledged, than the prop track data, which is uh, only being ramped up a little bit recently by the Real Estate Institute, uh, that they've got some 
their own data, and there's there's a bit of a divergence, but basically one of them's got prices from the peak level down or from the first rate hike, I should say, down around about 6.3%, I think it is at the moment. The other's about 4.2%. So prices, yeah, they've come off a bit, and that's over a six-month time frame. There's probably some more weakness there based on the interest rate structure, but, and it's a capital B, capital U, capital T, um, we are seeing that the rental market is as tight as a drum. You know, we we see the data from our friends at SQM Research, you know, Lewis Christopher there with uh, the data showing that rental vacancy rates are basically at record lows. There's almost no property. And if I can give a little shout out to my son, who's actually looking to relocate in the rental market in Sydney, the place that he's leaving, uh, he's just sort of on the internet, and the landlord has hiked the uh, rent in his place by 35%. Whether he gets it or not, or he or she get it, I don't know, but that's a little anecdote. But, you yeah, know, the tight rental market it does have implications for prices because people do the equation, it's going to cost me X dollars to rent. If it costs much the same to buy, why don't I buy? And even though the investor market's been weakening in the finance numbers that were out earlier today too, they've been a fraction more resilient than the owner-occupier side. So it says to me that investors, if they can get a good rental yield, they can buy a property that's going to be rented pretty much immediately because there's nothing on the market. Uh, They look at some of the volatility that's occurring in equities and they might think, well, gee, the tax um, office is still going to be very generous with negative gearing. That debate's dead and buried for for several or many more years, the investors might step up and, of course, put a bit of a floor under the lower-priced property. So, yeah, weakness, I think, is still there. Clearly, sentiment to buy a house is still weak, but fundamentals and immigration commencing again, you know, you can see that there could be a base formed in the price uh, market, you know, in the first quarter of next year. That's an interesting uh, point there on the rental market, core logic further increases. Uh, I guess um, SQM has shown the same with its asking rents are up more than 20%, I think, over the yeah. year in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane. Very, very strong increases. I guess this bit uh, ties back to what we were talking about. The reason for interest rate increases in the first place is yeah. high rates of inflation. Uh, I guess on the other side of the equation, we've seen borrowing capacity, at least from the peak, you know, the pandemic uh, frenzy, borrowing capacity in some cases down 20 to 30%. Now, you mentioned the other day, the Reserve Bank has done some research into this and shows that, I guess, that most borrowers don't use their full borrowing capacity on the one hand. But then I guess, on the other hand, at the margin, there must be some borrowers who are heavily levered and that must move prices at the margin. What do you think about borrowing capacity as a driver for the housing market and prices? Yeah, again, it's it's clearly a negative, but uh, in the olden days on an income of X with interest rates at Y, you can borrow Z. And if um, uh, the interest rates are going up you know, rapidly, which, which they have, then Z is actually lower. Uh, now, that assumes that your income isn't going up, which, okay, we've got very weak wages or relatively weak wages growth still. Uh, so that borrowing capacity has reduced. So therefore, when you turn up at the auction, you're constrained by your level of debt. So that, that's clearly true. But if that's also occurring at a time when people are perhaps chipping away at their savings, you know, getting a you know, term deposits now, you can get 3.5% readily, you know, relatively easily now. So um, maybe we're going to be seeing something of an offset. But sure, if it's harder for the for you to get a loan, if the bank's saying to you, we'll only lend you $500,000 now instead of 600000 which might have been the capacity that you could have gone to, uh, say, eight or 12 months ago, then clearly when you go up to, to the auction, you're going to be bidding a lower price by, by definition. So, again, it, it's it's pointing to a negative, of course, and that's the simple sort of uh, uh, mathematical logic that some people put into their uh, models when they're saying house prices have got to drop 20% because people just can't borrow as much. Yeah, there's a, there's an element of truth in that, but that's sort of a, a little bit too mechanical for my thinking, and doesn't take account of the fact that your household incomes are growing. Uh, the labour market for now is still firm or strong, under three and a half percent unemployment rate. So people have a greater ability to borrow money when unemployment's three and a half than when it's six percent. So you know, borrowing capacity nationwide, not for the individual, but nationwide, has been enhanced by the fact that we've got record low unemployment. Yeah, it's a good point. I think the full employment. Uh aspect is one of the things that's kept mortgage arrears so low is that effectively there is a job at the moment for everyone 
who wants or needs one within reason anyway. There's more hours available for workers if they want them. Those sorts of things, you know, they're strongly uh, pulling in the other direction. Now, Steve, you're a, a chief economist and a former Labour uh, advisor. Um, so I guess, you know, hot topic, we've just had the federal budget, the first one under the Labour Party in a few years. Um, so I guess there's a lot to talk about in terms of the budget. I guess the big announcement from from a housing market perspective, at least, was the target of a million well-located homes b- between 2024 and 2029. But any um, standouts or comments on the budget from your perspective? Look, it was pretty much um, that uh, good length of delivery the foot outside off stump in the opening over, you just let it go through to the keeper. I don't think there was much there in any sense, which is not always a bad thing. While, you know, a few of us will be saying, come on, Jim Chalmers, you know, why don't you tackle some of the tax issues? Why don't you sort of try to repair the budget more rapidly? Why don't you implement a range of other uh, budgetary sort of fiscal measures to try to improve equity and inequality issues and these sorts of things? At the end of the day, they did a, a little bit, and yes, me, not being an elected person, um, can sort of screech from the sidelines like many other people can too. But, yeah, they've clearly got one eye on the politics. And to, to be fair, I think it's also clear that they wanted just to sort of put a little bit of a small stamp on their ownership of economic conditions with the budget in October. And that when we come to May, I'm well aware that just a little bit around the corner here in Canberra, the people in the Treasury building are working damn hard on the May budget. And I dare say we'll be seeing a lot more come the new year of the Treasurer and perhaps the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher, flying a few flags about things that might be included in that budget because there's a very, very long list of reforms and ideas and agendas that will be, you know, being floated right now to repair the budget, increase productivity and these sorts of other things. And I think... uh, the Labor Party, Jim Chalmers, wants to achieve. Yeah, so I think it was, you know, as you said, it was a fairly, uh, to use the cricketing terminology, it was a bit of a straight bat type of budget, a bit of a nip and tuck affair. There wasn't too much to spook the horses, so to speak. I, I guess given where inflation is, you know, the highest level in a few decades, then uh, maybe um, it, it wasn't uh, much to be expected. One of the interesting notes, Steve, I mentioned um, or noticed in the federal budget papers uh, tucked away in the notes was just on population policy. Um, Mm -hmm. So the permanent migration cap has been increased to 195,000. So the budget projects net overseas migration of 235,000, well, uh, practically ad infinitum every year across the, uh, the horizon. On and off, it's been a hot topic over the past decade or so since the mining boom because we had very strong rates of immigration through the mining boom, but then it just carried on. We kind of got addicted to this high rate of population growth. But it's, um, I guess, it's always been a t- difficult subject to debate because anybody who talks about a lower population growth uh, seems to get tarred with a a brush of being xenophobic or anti-immigration, but it's um, of course it's not a it's not a yes or no question. There's something there about the the right rate of population growth that the economy can cope with and infrastructure can deal with. Um, do you have any thoughts on the population <laughs> policy? I'm I'm agreeing with you completely that there's an optimal amount, and that, and apart from the obvious humanitarian component that every country has, including Australia, and that's very, very important. The more discretionary skilled migration is one where I think it could be used more as an economic lever in a sense, that when you do have a very tight labour market, skill shortages, the economy's been strong, you can sort of tweak it up a little bit. And when the economy is weak, you tweak it down. So one level of set and forget is not quite the right strategy for me when it comes to the immigration policy. Uh, But that said, you've also got this scenario that, again, you alluded to quite nicely that, you know, in the, say, the decade before the uh, onset of the COVID uh, lockdowns, that we had really high immigration and we had really high house price growth linked to that particular shortage of supply relative to the demand from a couple of hundred thousand people coming in each year. So that was part of it. You also had the infrastructure shortfall. So we had 
you know, again, around Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, state governments building like crazy, you know, roads and public transport infrastructure, the rail system, because they are inadequate for the number of people. So, you know, basically Sydney in increased its population by a million, as did Melbourne, with the same old infrastructure. So they had to revamp their infrastructure spending. And that sort of also feeds into infrastructure for health system, hospitals, schools. You know, so there is an issue that does come with high immigration. And while these new people do come in, they work, they add to economic growth, they consume and, and they invest and the like, there is still this uh, issue of too much of a good thing. So uh, an analogy is sort of like having good red wine. You know, there's if you can have too much of it <laughs> and have a nasty hangover. And I think Australia had that hangover pre-COVID and now we've got the ramp up. So the first couple of years of catch up after we had, you know, net outflow of people during the COVID lockdowns, probably okay. But I think we need to be very careful that in, you know, the not too distant future, that number doesn't become embedded at a very high level at a time when, again, we we're sort of um, bleeding about housing affordability and, and infrastructure constraints. Do you want to save on buyer's agent fees? You could save thousands with Buyer's Buyers. As Australia's most extensive network of buyer's agents, we can lock in highly competitive prices. Plus, our national network of buyer's agents are some of the best in the business. So get the buyer's buyer's advantage and talk to us today. Call 1800 975 051 or visit buyersbuyers.com.au. Yeah, I mean, I went to uh, the cricket at the Gabba yesterday, as you know, and I was stuck in traffic at midnight. Um, oh. Now, you know, yeah. that's partly because they were doing roadworks and whatnot. But, um, yeah, it, it does sort of make you think that um, if we're about to embark on, uh, well, looking at the budget papers, uh, it's not just the net overseas migration. Of course, the population grows naturally anyway. Um, fertility rates were up, at, up in 2021 and yeah. generally – you know, COVID aside, people are living longer. So births uh, comfortably exceed deaths every year. So and in, you... in three years' time, Australia's going to have approximately another million people to, yeah, to exactly. house and to educate and to get into the health system. Yep, it's a, yeah. it, it's a big number. And if you project it out to 2030, well, we could see the population going from 26 to 29 million, broadly speaking. Yeah. You know, it's big, big numbers. And in that context, a million homes in five years actually... By the time you sort of take out the demolitions, which tend to be 25,000 a year, it's probably the bare minimum that we would need to look at. Um, it's a bit of a cheeky forecast, that one. It's a bit like the other one that, yeah, we're going to create a million jobs over five years, which, <laughs> as we're just alluding to, is just population growth. You know, if you create a million jobs in five years, you actually don't make any inroads into the unemployment rate, you know, whereas, of course, economics is about getting the unemployment rate materially lower. Well, yes, the, I remember the old uh, million jobs in five years, which um, yeah. I guess was a steady state scenario, but I guess it got the headlines uh, that were desired, I guess, in the same way that the, the uh, one million homes by <laughs> 2029 did. Uh, yeah. Steve, I had one other sort of thing that's been sort of gnawing at me, and that's the, the fixed rate mortgage cliff. So you know, normally in Australia, we have about only about 20% of loan balances are on fixed rate mortgages and the vast bulk of them four fifths are on variable rates but then for we had six consecutive quarters from september 2020 quarter through to the end of 2021 where we had extremely high share of fixed rate mortgages each quarter and now those are starting to roll off because the most common tenor of fixed rate mortgage in australia is two years um so just around now november 2022 a lot of those loans that were written at say two percent might be resetting to uh, six, and of course, you know, we we had the lending assessment buffer of three percentage points. But I guess that you know, if we see the the share of fixed rate mortgages going from what nearly forty percent back to twenty, that that's going to have to punch a hole, I guess, in household consumption. Do you think it could be anything worse than that? I'm wondering whether people who were lucky enough smart enough to lock in their mortgages for a couple of years at that 2% level a year or two or three ago, have used that implied saving to put the money in the bank or in an offset account. So when they do face that incredible lift, there's no doubt about it, that big lift in their monthly repayments, they, while they might swear and curse, they have the capacity to pay it. They've got the savings or the income to uh, cover it. 
that said, clearly it's going to be a shock for a lot of people who perhaps weren't that uh, prudent and uh, sensible with their financial planning. And when they see that jump in uh, their monthly repayments, they're going to be hit very, very hard and that'll create some financial problems, some legitimate financial problems for some householders. So um, the other thing to remember that, you know, again, even in a low wages environment, this isn't quite the same, but, uh, you know, household incomes are growing at sort of four and a half or five percent slightly different for wages, of course, and over two or a three-year fixed term, your wage has gone up by 10 or 15%. So yeah, there, there are some offsets uh, to the sort of cliff, if you like, and it is a big one. I'm, I'm not trying to downplay it. It will be an important issue. But I've got a you know, suspicion, again, that it won't be all bad. The Reserve Bank know about it. Maybe that's why they're treading cautiously, so they're not going to see these people jump into an interest rate structure that's, you know, four or five percentage points higher than they than they got into. And that's why they're perhaps being a little bit more cautious as well. So it gets back to that point of the capacity of or the ability of people to make their repayments. And as you as again you touched on, at the moment there's not real evidence of any jump in arrears or for that matter, any forced selling of property. So that sort of panic that you would see if people genuinely can't cope would show up in arrears and or uh, a jump in people saying stuff this, I'm going to sell my house, I have to get out of it because I can't afford to make my repayments. Yes, which may happen if you get cases of uh, negative equity. Like, I guess there's there's some headroom for some of the worst hit borrowers to get or to be sure. cushioned by lenders on maybe interest-only terms or even, as we thought, through the pandemic, mortgage holidays um, can be used in the more extreme cases. Um, just the, the challenge for some borrowers is that um, lending standards got tightened up and October 2021, a lot of people might be stuck on the uh, the terms of the mortgage they've got uh, offered to them by the existing lender. But if you can, phone the bank for a better rate or shop around because uh, generally speaking, you'll get some pretty good outcomes by just picking up the phone. So Steve, final question. i um, seen a lot of debate over last year or two about the sort of peak to trough decline in housing prices. And of course, this is macro, you know, there'll be some markets that do better, like Adelaide has, there'll be others where maybe some of those hinterland (laughs) properties or down on the Mornington Peninsula might get hit harder because they had the bigger boom. But do you have a a sense of um, sort of at the macro level, peak to trough, what kind of declines you might expect, uh, given that all of those factors we talked about? Nationwide, uh, about a year ago, I think it was, I sort of said the fall would be about 7%. My little back of the envelope calculations were saying minus 7. And as we were saying with the core logic numbers, it's now minus 6.5 approximately. So it'll probably exceed the minus 7%. But with those other factors that we were talking about before, population growth, the end, near the end of the rate hike and cycle, a solid labour market, uh, a tight rental market, these sorts of positives to work as a as a partial antidote to the rate hikes and perhaps the the, the fixed rate mortgage problems that will be coming around the corner anytime soon. We're probably close to the end. So, look, if I was to sort of recast my forecast now, I'd probably say minus 10, but, you know, that would be about it. And even having said that, you know, there's, again, as you were touching on, even in the sort of weekly core logic numbers, there's evidence that there's deceleration in the pace of decline. That's not oxymoronic. I can't have to think about that for a minute. But, um, you know, the, the pace of decline is only about 0.2 a week now. So that's 0.8% per month, you know, monthalized. So you've got to have this sort of uh, view on what is actually happening. And when you look at things like the auction clearance rates, uh, they're into the 60-odd percent uh, rather than the 50s. There's not a lot of properties on the market for sale, or you know, despite the seasonality, it should be a higher level. Prices are still falling. Yep, no question. Maybe the seven percent was a bit too optimistic. Maybe I was working on the assumption that demographics would have been more powerful or wages would have been stronger. I think that's probably my error. Uh, but to sort of see a minus twenty or minus twenty-five, you, you need the Rabia to hike a couple of hundred basis points, and you need the labour market to deteriorate, and neither of those two things are likely. Yeah, certainly at this point, um, as you said, the the pace of decline seems to have been easing. Uh, I think we've seen in previous cycles as well that when people get a sense of uh, normality returning, things can snap back very quickly, uh, especially in Sydney and Melbourne. We've seen that in 2019 and in previous cycles. But at the moment, lots of people just cautiously 
city on the sidelines looking for a, almost a green light for for things to uh, to be looking brighter. And uh, look, maybe, um, as you mentioned, in Q1 next year, Don Perrottet in New South Wales is <laughs> floating a, um, a stamp duty exemption for first-time buyers up to $1.5 million. So, I mean, that, that could be itself a trigger, for, at least for the lower end of the market, to recover. But uh, in the meantime, I guess uh, people will be watching those inflation figures carefully for some signs of... Uh, Better news. Uh, Stephen, if uh, people want to connect with you, you're the MD of Market Economics, but where's the best place to track you down? You're going to say uh, on Twitter, aren't you? Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm sort of a bit of a fan of LinkedIn because people have to disclose who they are, unlike Twitter. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a fan of uh, Musk's idea that you've got to pay for your blue tick if you want one. So, uh, But yeah, just on Twitter, just give me a shout. Uh, I've got the kook.com as my, uh, .au as my website. So um, be in touch, send me a message. LinkedIn, whatever. I'm pretty easy to find. Fabulous. When you're not uh, thanks, jetting off around the Greek islands, of course. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. uh, well, thanks so much, Stephen. I look forward to maybe catching up uh, in the new year when we can find out uh, where those peak to trough declines in the market uh, landed. And um, yeah, we'll also see with interest what happens to the cash rate target over the next few months as well. Fascinating times. Thanks, Pete. Look forward to catching up sometime soon. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Pete's Property Podcast, powered by Buyers Buyers. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next time as Pete chats all things property with a new guest. And just a reminder that the information provided in this podcast is general advice only and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation or needs. You should always consult a licensed professional to discuss your individual personal circumstances.